after e4, e6, d4, d5. I would like to introduce you with a Lohin Gambit, then after knight c3 and bishop b4, move which we uh, usually call the Vinaver variation in the French defense, where black is immediately trying to attack uh, the white's knight on c3, so to, to put more pressure over the white's e4 pawn and just try to force white or to exchange in the center after e takes d4, d5, or to push e4, e5, which would fix white's pawn center and would allow black immediately to counterattack with c7 and c5. So, however, instead of playing e takes d5 and instead of playing e4, e5, white could go for quite interesting gambit line, which was suggested uh, already in the last century by Alexander Alohin, who uh, played very often this knight g1 to e2 line. Even today, uh, this move is a not so rare guest in the tournament practice, and even I saw a few games played this line even by Grandmaster. So white is offering black to capture the pawn on e4, which leads to very interesting complications. So, first of all, I would like to show you the game between Alexander Alohin and Aron Nimcevic played in Bled 1931 at one of the most famous chess tournaments where Alohin performed so good that uh, the rest of the player were just out of the tournament, we can say. So, Alohin won with a very big game this very strong tournament. So, and Nimcevic decided to go for Gambit line. So, he, after a3, captured on c3, knight takes c3, and of course decided to protect the pawn after f5. The problem is that in case of playing knight f6, white always can go with bishop g5 and hardly even black can protect this pawn on e4. After which white is getting slight but uh, quite significant advantage in the space. <coughs> So f5, of course, is the most principal and most interesting continuation, and that is the main point of the a, gambit. So white definitely could go for bishop c4, which already happened in the game between Marozzi and Georg in 1924. However, after knight f6 and bishop g5, white is playing here for positional compensation. When Alohin's gambit started with f3 move is a real gambit, so white is going for the development advantage and ready to sacrifice one more pawn. He takes f3 and look at that, queen takes f3. Very big surprise for black, it's not that uh, white is giving the pawn on d4, that, but that after black decided to play queen takes d4, White not playing bishop e3 or bishop d4 or bishop f4, but going for queen g3. Very interesting, very strong option. Pawn on g7 under threat, so White is intending to play bishop e3 and long castling, so castling very soon. Knight c6 again would be met by bishop b5, so also c7 pawn at the threat. White is having right now two pawns down, but quite significant initiative and of course clear development advantage. So here a, the recommendations after the game were that probably black could try play knight c6 or knight e7, but uh, Nimcevic decided to develop his pieces very fast, played knight f6, even ready to sacrifice back this pawn on g7. So the main trouble, of course, for black is that after queen takes g7, he cannot uh, prevent whites from continuing his attack against the black skin over the dark squares. So you see that black has no dark squ uh, square bishop, and uh, after queen e5 check move, which considered not so good. Later recommendation were rook g8, but even here, after queen takes c7, knight c6, Alohin suggested just to play for white bishop f4 with 
very unpleasant idea. Rook d1 and not so clear how Black could solve his problems. So, later on in 1969, Keris also suggested bishop f4 as the strongest continuation which keeps white clear advantage. But let's back to the game. Queen e5 check. Bishop e2. Rook g8. Queen h6. So again, white is ready to give the pawn on g2. Nimsovich played here in this position rook g6, but even after rook takes g2, bishop f4, queen d4, white simply plays bishop e3, queen e5, and after long casting, there is almost no way to, for black to escape from the threats like bishop f4, like bishop d4, white's position is clearly, clearly better. So, rook g6, played in the game. Queen h4. So refreshing the threats to bring the bishop to f4. Bishop d7. Same problem after rook take g2. Why just simply plays bishop f4. Maybe better for black was to try and to send the white's queen away by playing rook g4. However, still after queen f2, white keeps all his threats and clearly better game. Bishop d7 and now Bishop g5. So what is intended to play long castling and in right moment to play Bishop f4. Now in case of Knight c6, long castling. If Black also plays long castling, White has very unpleasant tactical trick. Bishop h5 and Black is losing exchange at any case. Knight takes h5, bishop takes d8. So, Nimsevich moved his bishop to c6, tried to support the knight on, on f6 by the other knight from d7. However, long castle, bishop takes g2, rook h to e1, bishop e4, and Still the same problem. Bishop h5. So white is having all his pieces in the game. Rook centralized. Lot of open files. Black's king is still in the center. So it's not a big surprise that game is finished so fast. So black should tap capture on h5. But after rook d8 check. King f7. Rook, look at that. Queen takes h5 in just 20 moves. One of the strongest chess grandmasters in that time, Aron Nimsevich, was completely destroyed by this great Alohin's gambit in the French win hour. So after Queen takes h5, move 19, Nimsevich already resigned in view of King g7. White simply plays Knight takes e4, F takes e4, only move, and Bishop h6. Unfortunately, the Queen is gone, and the game is over. The king f6, rook f8, etc. So let's uh, look again for the line which occurs in this, in this game because this is quite critical lines and try to improve black's play. So e4, e6, d4, d5, knight c3, bishop b4. Knight e2, d takes e4, a3, bishop takes c3, knight takes c3, f5, and f3. e takes f3, queen takes f3. Later on, after this game, we raise the question, so if the queen takes d4 and queen g3 is so dangerous for black, then g3 square is so unpleasant, so maybe we can try and to play queen h4 check first and just force white to move his pawn on g3 or to force white to exchange queens. Definitely even after queen f2, queen takes f2, white is having, king takes f2 of course, white is having quite significant initiative for the pawn. However, still is possible to play g3. Queen takes d4 and now 
Alohin's recommendation here was oh, knight b5, by the way, which happened in the game between Korbut and Savchenko in St. Petersburg Open Tournament in 2002. Then after queen c5, bishop e3, queen e7, bishop g5, knight f6, bishop takes f6, so necessary for black to capture with g pawn. All the time white were speculating uh, uh, with his bishop sacrifice because the c7 pawn would be just lead to, to the situation where black is losing exchange in case black is accepting the bishop. Now queen h5 check again. Black doesn't have time to play queen f7 because after trading and knight takes c7 the game is just over. So black played king f8, queen h6, king f7 and here a uh, long castling uh, lead to the quite interesting position where white is having very strong attack. So white is intending bishop e2. In case of a6, knight could go always to d4 and again continue threatening black's position on the king side. So let's back uh, to the critical point after g3 and queen takes d4 because uh, Alohin later on played a quite interesting game against uh, Wilkins in 1933 where he continued bishop f4 queen d7 more or less forced bishop d3 knight f6 long castling queen f7 knight b5 Knight d5, and already after bishop takes c7, white won one pawn back. Since the bishop cannot be touched, knight d6 just wins by force. Short castling, bishop d6, rook d8, bishop c4, a6, bishop takes d5, a takes b5. Bishop b3, knight a6, rook h to e1, and even here Alohin still keeps very strong position. So it's just quite a difficult defense for black. White is having too strong bishop, a lot of pressure over the e6, f5, b5 weaknesses. So after rook e8, rook e5, Suddenly, black is already losing material because bishop d7 could be met by rook takes f5. Look at that. The pawn e6 is pinned in almost everywhere. So, after g6, rook takes b5, suddenly black's position is almost lost. So, this was a game between Alexander Alohin and Tom Wilkins from Washington, simultaneous exhibition in 1933. Okay, let's back. So, after bishop f4, in his book about uh, French defense, uh, Boris Minev uh, suggested to play c6. Just also to avoid knight b5 and also to, to try and to develop the pieces very fast. But black just played too many moves already with, with the pawns. So white already can play queen h5 check, g6, queen e2, and now we have new threat, bishop e5. Let's say after queen g7 and long castling, white is intending bishop e5 next. For instance, after knight f6, queen d2. No time for black to castle because bishop h6. King f7, bishop h6, queen g8, bishop c4, queen e8, and this position was just heavy analyzed by Schwartz in 1967. When after his recommendation g4, 
white is still keeping amazing attack. The main point of this g4 move that white is also intending g takes f5 or g4 g5 and if black allowed it by capturing accepting the sacrifice that suddenly knight e4 leads to the winning position for white so there is no way for black to stop lot of threats over the dark square knight e6 knight g5 queen d4 and after f takes e4 rook f1 check Knight f6 could be made by rook takes f6, king takes f6, and queen f4. King e7, and so you can suggest your way to checkmate black's king. And if black plays in this position king g8, so white simply could finish the game by rook f8 or even queen d8 leads to the totally winning position for white. Black's problem is that after bishop d7 and bishop takes e6 there is no way to escape from the checkmate. So you can now realize that uh, f5, f3, e takes f3 and queen takes f3 leads to amazing attack for white. So white is having so long term initiatives that usually black is trying not to accept this pawn sacrifice that way so f5 just weakens too much black's position so let's back to the starting point of our gambit knight e2 d takes e4 a3 bishop takes e3 knight takes e3 so in 1934 Rudolf Spielmann, after the few brilliant wins of Alexander Lohin, also included this opera into, into his repertoire. And as we know, Rudolf Spielmann is one of the most famous attacking players in, in the history, who never just saw twice and was always brave to play the King's Gambit in the tournament practice and even against the best and top players in the world. So in his game against Alexander Mach from Kaunas, 1934, after knight f6, bishop g5, knight bd7, knight takes e4, as I explained in from the previous line, here everywhere white is keeping the advantage. And let's look how Spielmann played this position with white. h6, bishop h4. So this pin is quite unpleasant. So black is trying to get rid of it and to play g5, but knight takes f6, queen takes f6, bishop g3, and white achieved two bishop and space advantage without much compensation from black side. The try of his opening to play c5 after c3, c takes d4 and c takes d4, queen e7 only lead to the situation when after h4 white is just showing black's king side so the threat h take g5 always so unpleasant so black doesn't have time to play knight f6 and the after h5 h take g5 white achieved exactly what usually we are saying when you have two bishops advantage please Try to open the position as soon as possible. Bishop e2, so now h5 pawn is a real target. h4, and again, white is using tactics. Queen d2, so black cannot exchange the queens because the pawn on h4 is, is lost. Queen f6 only answer. Bishop d6, rook g8, g3, again, Spielman is going to Spielmann is going to, to open up the position for his diff, bishops. Takes, takes on g3, knight b6, no time for black to continue developing his pieces. Rook h6, queen f5, bishop d3, queen d5, queen f4, Threaten rook h7, threaten bishop c, bishop e4, bishop d7, bishop e4, 
So only now Black realized that Queen takes d4 is just losing immediately. Why? Definitely White can play Rook d1, but uh, it seems like this sacrificing move is even stronger. So now if f takes e6 and after bishop g6 the queen is gone. And same would happen after bishop takes e6, bishop c6 and again black is losing queen in the center of the board. So black uh, moved his queen to b3 but white's next move came as a real shock. Because white just played queen g5 and ready to sacrifice the queen in order to create the strong mating threat on e7 so now in case of rook take g5, rook h8 check black's king is going to be mated, rook g8, rook take g8 so one more nice game in the Alohin Gambit where we can see quite easy way how to play with your two bishops advantage. So in 1933 one more game was played with this line by Alohin when for the first time his opponent decided not to accept the sacrifice and to play solid bishop e7 line. So let's go to this game. Uh, played in the uh, a Bratislava simultaneous exhibition between Alohin and Lista. 92, d takes e4, a3, and here Black decided that it's too dangerous to capture on c3 and just played bishop e7. Even today, this move considered as one of the strongest continuations for Black. Knight takes e4. Now White achieved what exactly they, they like. They have a space advantage. Pawn on d4 is slightly more active than pawn on e6. For black to push c5 is extremely dangerous. Uh, also, white is ready to bring his knight or to c3 or to g3 and then to develop the bishop from f1. Bishop from c1 usually is going to c4 to f4. Knight f6. Knight g3, short castling, c3. So Alohin plays this line very safe. Defends his pawn on d4, ready to bring the bishop to d3. And still, black cannot push c5, cannot attack our center. c6, I believe this move is just too passive. Black had to play knight bd7. Bishop d3, b6. Short castling, bishop b7, queen e2, knight bd7, bishop f4. So still here and there, uh, black, uh, which has less space in this situation, always is important move in such a position is just to capture on e4 and then try to exchange one more piece after knight f6 or to prepare c5 however black is just helping white by playing knight d5 bishop d2 I believe that uh, Alohin considered move like f5 in this situation but uh, was not so scared because White always could think about move like knight g5 and then queen takes e6 or knight e6, bishop takes d6, queen takes e6 check. However, in all these lines there is some problem for white. Let's say in that line, after queen takes d6 and rook f6, the queen is trapped. And after knight g5, Bishop takes g5, queen takes e6, rook f7, so black is also covering everything. And not so clear where white is compensation. So in this position after f5, uh, Alohin would uh, 
try to use all his uh, tactical talent to find probably the best option for while here is to play c4 and after f takes e4 c takes d5 uh, black even can just simply recapture on d5 or to play of course queen takes e4 knight f6 queen takes e6 with only slight compensation for, for a piece so it it means that uh, white's last move bishop d2 was maybe not so precise however in the simultaneous exhibition black uh, played knight back to f6 and Alokhin achieved quite easy advantage rook a to d1 queen c7 f4 c5 knight g5 h6 when his opponent completely missed knight x e6 move f x e6 queen x e6 now rook f7 could be met by bishop g6 king h8 again white cannot capture the uh, bishop because rook a to e8 but allow him continue his attack on the king side knight f5 bishop d8 knight h4 so all light squares near the king are extremely weak rook e8 and knight g6 check king h7 knight e5 check king h8 knight f7 check king g8 knight x h6 check and finally why to move and win could you guess the final shot so I could tell you that this position uh, so famous and I saw it so many puzzles white plays queen g8 and this is a smoother it mate knight take g8 or rook take g8 would be met by knight f7 and the game is over